These two great economies are being paired side by side and comparing which of them seem to have the strength to end strongly at the end of the decade. Good morning and welcome to the show. Do you find it strange or do you find it odd that India is being compared with China? Well, it, it's not anything strange. Uh, you know, uh, historically speaking, uh, civilization rises and decline. Uh, that, that's obvious in history. And uh, uh, you saw from time immemorial, you had a rare China overtaken by, uh, of course, uh, the Greek Roman Empire was at, at the time. You had um, now the English uh, civilization came, gone down, and then the American civilization. So over time, you see through history, uh, civilization rises, and then it gets to a crescendo and start to come down, and that decline. Uh, that you see already in China, and you see, uh, it, they used to be the most populous nation in the world before about two or three years ago that India has overtaken uh, China as the most populous country in the world. And that's because uh, of certain policy that were put in place in China, the one bed uh, per family policy had worked uh, severely for them at the time why they were trying to ensure that uh, not too many mouths to feed, why poverty was everywhere. Now poverty is off everywhere. You are now having an aging population. So what that means is that productivity is declining in China. Uh, it cannot be as healthy as it used to be. And you find that in India, we're also having um, a modernizing regime under Modi that the last eight years and see what uh, Modi has been able to do in uh, India, changing the entire narrative. And uh, sometime yesterday I was looking at him and he was saying that he was going to continue uh, his social investment uh, in, uh, programs, uh, uh, even if he wins this coming election. What that means is that Modi had been able in the last eight years taking over a hundred million Indians out of poverty. So when you move people out of poverty, you have moved them to a gainful employment. That was when productivity in that area also rises. So if this trajectory continues, it will not just be a matter of a few months or, or years. You will see India becoming the uh, world's biggest economy. And don't forget that since the 1970s, India has greatly invested in education which is actually the precursor to um, productivity. And one thing that uh, the Modi regime also had done for India is that you can either be an India or a non-India. So where you are an India, it means that you have a national ID card of India. So you cannot hold another person's nationality. So you can only be an India at one. So if you become a national of another country, you lose the India ID. So that's what it means. We are no longer an India that, the, from the hierarchy. So all this also has fostered a whole lot that's happening that most Indians don't want to lose their nationality. So they don't maintain dual nationality. So keep their nationality and they are one at home because that card is, of course, precious to a lot of people. So it's not um, by accident that you see globally as we speak, uh, all the Fortune 500 companies, most of them are having Indians as a CEO. And of course, recently we saw what happened with uh, Sunak in, uh, in uh, UK becoming uh, the first uh, non indigenous or Christian prime minister in the UK. To tell you how far they've gone really globally in terms of how the education has propped up some level of productivity. So this on the ground, uh, India actually is moving on the right direction and they are doing things right, of course. Uh, this is already telling on the level of economic growth that's happening uh, in the India economy. Now, the India economy has been able to maintain the annual growth of 6% for months, and um, analysts have predicted that if India can continue on this trajectory, it might be the largest economies in the world. But let's look at some of the critical factors that could drive this kind of growth. You know, what comparative advantage does India, you know, has? And then what critical sectors do you think will influence or drive this 
annual growth if that is going to happen soon. Yeah, but, but you know, uh, uh, talking about competitiveness, uh, India is a very competitive country. Uh, why, for example, Chinese had um, really a, a grow proficiency in production of hardware. India has majored in software development. And in a knowledge-based economy, driven almost by software, he tells you where India could be. Uh, most of the uh, services that are rendered globally today, a number of them are done from India to across the world. You have telephone company here, the customer service rep is in India. They are sitting down in India and they are preparing tax return for companies in America because of the uh, power they have. Uh, in the software region. So that's where their strength really lies, and uh, the focus on education, and especially the STEM education, science, technology, and you know, engineering, and mathematics. So uh, India is a pioneer of STEM education, and that has helped greatly in the development of the software, of course, which, of course, is a real powerhouse for the computerization and digitization of the entire space. All right, so the projection that uh, India might overtake China's economy also uh, shows that uh, China's economy has grown at 10% uh, over the last three decades. But in this decade, uh, by 2028, it will slow down to about 3.5%, while India's economy will grow at 9%. And the advantage for India's economy is that it has a youthful market, but it also has infrastructure deficits. Now, do you see India being able to put, to put those infrastructure deficits in check as it is in attracting a lot of manufacturing companies because of its youthful markets? Well, I, I, I think uh, uh, the Indian presidency is doing a whole lot in terms of uh, investing massively and hugely on infrastructure development. And that, of course, is because the economy is productive and you're making so much returns from whatever thing that you're doing. Uh, India took a very bold step in removing subsidy, which, of course, is the greatest enemy of modern capitalist economy. So. Uh, once he was able to do, take that very bold step in ensuring that they were not servicing the very poor, the, the rich, that a subsidy became very targeted at the very poor in India, then the growth of India started. Yes, you're having a youthful economy, but of course, uh, an average Indian child is almost a genius, a near genius, because of high, huge investment in the Krishna sector. And that's what I'm saying, that they are shipping even their brain outside of India to other parts and, of the globe who are working and developing solutions in a knowledge-based economy. So that's working for India. There's virtually any place you go to in the world, you will see India, India droves who are right there working. So they may not want to start to build manufacturing uh, companies as, as it were. So where their strength is, is where they need to really focus. And of course, as software development continue to grow, uh, you see them also seen trying to also play, even in the semiconductor area, at least they are having up to about 2% of semiconductor production globally. All of all these things is require massive investment, more for India. Many more people will be taking off poverty. And as these people, of course, the land is there for them. Uh, they have a body of water. And then, of course, uh, some resources are also available to them. Today, as we speak, India is not just self-sufficient in terms of electricity and energy supply. India is also supplying electricity to neighboring countries because they have been able to deal with the issue in the energy sector. And then, of course, they have made huge gain. So this is what is working for them. And what you just need to do is to see how to urbanize the rural India. And then, of course, you get them uh, to engage the youthful populations and, and more productivity, more wealth and prosperity for India, as it were. 
Now, India is expected to commence its election April 19th, um, and, um, you know, campaigns are ongoing. And then if you look at the critical issues now, as to do with the economy and the foreign policy, how will you assess the Prime Minister in this regard, his administ administration as regards his position to the economy, uh, how the economy has performed under his administration, and looking at the foreign policies in India? Will you give him a scorecard or a, a good performance? What would be your scorecard for the Prime Minister? Well, I have a very high regard and respect for Prime Minister Modi uh, since he had come in. A lot of people didn't give him a chance, uh, but he became the Prime Minister of India and has been doing massively in terms of um, uh, rebuilding the modern India. And uh, I think uh, he will be one president uh, after Gandhi that will not be easily forgotten. Uh, in the history of India because of uh, the strides that he has made in the last uh, few years that he has been the president or prime minister of India. So I'm expecting that, yeah, campaigns are going, he's likely to retain um, uh, leadership. Yes, the elite may not be so happy. And I think that, of course, you find is a cross of the campaign. And he's saying, look, I'm going to continue the social policy and see how we can get people off poverty, more people out of poverty, that the entire India become prosperous and working for all India, not just for select elites. And therefore, those who are bene direct beneficiaries of this uh, policy measure of Modi, you'll be sure to give them a uh, vote. Like I said, when they were, of course, liberalizing their energy sector, they were so strategic about it to identify the really very poor Indians and say, look, these people are the ones who need this help, so we need to give it to them. And you can imagine over 300 million people who will be rooting for him in this election. And that's a significant uh, number uh, in terms of uh, electoral victory. So I, I am sure that um, he will uh, still win based on the uh, uh, scorecard so far. But in the area of foreign policy, I am also very optimistic. And I know that uh, India has uh, maintained one straight foreign policy. Uh, and that is because India is almost like a socialist economy, like uh, China and the rest of it. So they're going to have more friends around the East than they will have in the West. So I am not shocked that India is playing a very key role in BRICS uh, because of uh, its ideological stance on certain issues. So that, of course, they came really not too much focus on the West, but looking at um, the second world as it were, as it will be called. So that focus is we can grow capacity. And that is why you also see they've also invested so much in gold reserve recently so that you can actually have currency gold backed. And then, of course, uh, that will remove or de-dollarize the economy in India and in the entire of the Southeast Asia. So this is all things that you're seeing playing now. And I think uh, for an average Indian who had the uh, Mahatma Gandhi background, uh, would love to support the kind of thing that uh, Modi is doing, whether at home or outside of the uh, Indian. I'm just wondering what this would mean at the end of the day, whether it's India or it's China, but this two Asian country growing so much at the end of the decade by 2028. Currently, uh, China's economy is valued at over $17 trillion, while India's economy is about $3.5 trillion. So if India ends up overtaking China at the end of the decade, and both of them being part of the BRICS, what would it mean for the West? Oh, yeah, that is what it is. Uh, uh, America is losing its popularity, and that's hugely. Uh, once uh, America, who used to be the, uh, we call those days the international policeman of the whole world, uh, loses uh, its potentials in terms of building an economy uh, that actually uh, were rooted on capitalist instincts now have tried uh, to use democracy to destroy the foundation of businesses. And that's a, and that's a sad uh, part of these things in the West. So most of the Western countries uh, uh, dragging democracy uh, to the extreme that you begin to fund uh, laziness and you're funding uh, poverty and the rest of it. 
and more importantly, you're also seeing uh, intervention in other countries' affairs that is actually taking away huge resource from uh, the countries of the West. Take, for example, uh, just uh, early this year for American budget to deal with the issue outside of insurance, the issues in uh, the Middle East, the issues in uh, some part of Africa, and then, of course, Afghanistan, the rest of it, and the, American was, and, uh, the Ukrainian war, uh, were looking out for about 700 billion U.S. dollars on military operation outside. Now, imagine that this is plunged into the business. Of course, companies will be doing well. Of course, your companies can now begin to enjoy tax holidays. So they are printing and printing dollars, and then, of course, uh, the economy is getting worse for it. So giving rise to these emergent uh, Asian economies. Now, we're having America, uh, China uh, struggling, and which, of course, for me, really is the biggest economy as we speak. And this is also now forming an alliance with India. What would that mean for the West? Mm. A powerless West. Wow. So power would have a change hand, as they say, hmm. in the local balance here. We're going to find out in 2028. <laughs> the conversation continues on early exchange, but not on India and China on something different. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Del Sao Samanze, for being in the studio with us. By the way, you look powerful this morning, what you're wearing. Thank you so very much. <laughs> well, he has a new baby. Yes. Oh, yes, that's true. <laughs> the Isle 104.9. So we can introduce him as the vice president of the Isle. Yes, <laughs> meet the vice president <laughs> of the Isle. <laughs> you can see Femi Wash is becoming bigger and better. Yes, yes. and Femi also always says that here, yeah, that the conversation oh, yes. gets bigger and better. Becoming bigger so and Femi Wash needs the uh, conversation that's getting bigger. And there's a whole lot that is on the think. And mm -hmm. uh, very soon you will be hearing that uh, the Abuja FM is also on course and uh, all to what God is doing. Oh, great. Okay. I can't wait. But first, Lagos wants to know where business meets bits. Oh, yes. The that Isle 104.9. <laughs> Early exchange, shaping policy, advancing development.